This is awesome. Come on, guys. You, you can show a little bit more excitement than that. This is, this is, really, this is really good. Uh, there is a pastor that texted me yesterday from uh, Thailand, and he's like, hey, Pepe, I see that you often do this five in five. And, uh, and how do you do it? And it's like, it's, and I, it, look, you know, first of all, it is a blessing to, to hear from people that don't regularly speak. You know what I'm saying? It's good for the church to know, um, you, know uh, you know, to hear a different experience. It's, it's good. It's healthy. It's like a, it's like a good uh, buffet. You know what I'm saying? If we, if we just eat the same thing, the same thing, you know, it's not good. It's not healthy. But when we eat from that buffet, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's going to be awesome and it's going to be well balance. I, I love, you know, uh, sitting down there and receiving from people from our church and the other guest speakers, you know. But the five in five is awesome. It's so special because none of these guys are professional speakers. Not that we are, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the rest of us, you know, we are, we all try to be obedient, you know what I'm saying? But it's awesome to see because, you know, some of them were like, I don't know if I can make it. You know, and somebody told me that speaking in, in, in front of people is one of, it's the number one fear. That, you know, that it's just, you know, publicly speaking. And, and it's like, you know what, these guys are here because even I'm sure that they are nervous. And, uh, and I'm sure that they've been praying. And I'm sure that many times they wanted to, to say, you know, Pepe, I'm, I'm out. But you know what, they are here, and it's a blessing to hear what the Lord is doing among our congregation, and, uh, and I'm really excited for this time, and so I invited these guys here to come, look at them, they look beautiful, and, uh, and, and, and just open your, ar- your, your, arts, your, your hearts, your, I was going to say arms, arts, your hearts to receive what the Lord wants to say through these people, amen? amen. Come on, let's go here, Laja, you're going first, buddy. Five minutes. Hello. Good morning. Uh, my name is Elijah, if I don't know you. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm a last minute sub into this, so you're also going to get a last minute message from me, just so you're getting a heads up. Uh, I'm going to be heavy on the notes as well. What's that? Thank you. You're welcome. We got it. Um, So today, I just wanted to share a little bit about evangelism, actually, and uh, more specifically, uh, evangelism through a lens of love. So it's a little bit of a different approach to what we're normally used to. And uh, I guess I should start. Who actually knows what evangelism is? is? Are we familiar with it? Do hands up. Got a few people. Yeah, so it's pretty common. Uh, It's... You know, it's part of the Great Commission, spreading the love of the gospel to everybody. We're all familiar with it. But who's sort of had an awkward or an uncomfortable encounter of going downtown to the streets or maybe in your neighborhood and just trying to share the gospel for the very first time? It's pretty, pretty tough to do, right? Yeah? Um, so uh, it's pretty tough to find the right words, the right person, the right timing. Like everyone is just kind of going their own direction. And to try and bump into someone, it's not so easy to do. So kind of want to talk about that a little bit today. And if you're from YWAM or you've done YWAM, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is the worst thing ever, just getting thrown into the streets and be like, go preach, go tell about Jesus. It's like, I don't know how to do this. But we've all been there, if, if, if you've done YWAM. Um, but I kind of want to bring it back to Jesus for a moment. And so much of our faith is to live a life that honors Christ, right? We're trying to be Christ-like in our living. And we look to Jesus, who's the author, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. And I love that word pioneer. Uh, I was actually looking up the definition of it. And it's one of, uh, it means to, to develop or be the first to apply a new method or way of doing something. So it's kind of neat in the way that it works. Um, in Jesus' case, he was, uh, he was the first to apply a new method to live a Christ-like life, right? He was Christ. It's, it's in his very nature. Um, And we look to him to be that great pioneer for us uh, so that we can also live that Christ-like life. And many of you guys know Charles Spurgeon, I'm sure. It's a very popular name. Uh, One of the lines he said a long time ago was, live in such a way that men may recognize that you have been with Jesus. So I think that's kind of a cool idea is that, you know, the more you're uh, closer to Jesus, it looks like you're with him all the time and he's part of you, right? Um, And going back to the Bible, you see in Mark 2 when... Jesus is uh, sitting at the table with a bunch of uh, tax collectors and sinners, and the Pharisees kind of come along, and they're looking at him like, 
why are you sitting with all these people? You know, you should be with the righteous. And he kind of looks back at them and says, um, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Right? And just that idea that Jesus is the perfect example. He's the pioneer of what it's like to, be, uh, to live an ev- evangelical life. Um, and um, there's, I also want to note that it's not just about going to be with like, the sinners, per se. It's also the people that might be broken or living a, a tough life. Um, you know, it's, it's everybody. It's not just those that are sinners or living a life that we don't recognize as uh, morally right, right? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm a little scattered today. We've got a bunch of notes going here. Uh, so one thing I, I like about Jesus is that it wasn't just one interaction that he had with one person. Like if he just came to the earth and was like, I'm going to heal that person, or maybe I'll hang out with that sinner for a little bit and then peace out, right? Like, he stuck around through it his entire life. So that's just a perfect example of, you know, our entire lives, we're going to be evangelizing. It's not like we're living for one moment and then just, you know, talking about other friends on Sunday, be like, you know, I evangelized last week. We had a crazy, amazing miracle happen, and it was awesome. And then you kind of live off that one memory, that one experience your whole life. So it's a matter of living it out every day. Um, Yeah, and... Uh, yeah, so kind of when Jesus is evangelizing, he, he's doing it out of love, right? He's not doing it because he feels obligated to do it. And to us sometimes it's like, yeah, we need to evangelize, but the idea is that we also do it out of love because it just makes it much more easy, much more simple, right? Um, and I kind of want to give a little shout out to actually two people in my life that I kind of see have this sort of evangelical, evangelical that's a tough word to say, my gosh, um, sort of lens of love, though, through the, the way that they evangelize. And, uh, and that's Mike. If, if you know Mike, if you don't know Mike, it's pretty hard to miss him. He's six foot seven. Um, but yeah, he'll do anything you ask for him, right? He's just always there for you, always willing to help. He's got that sort of servant-hearted love. Uh, and the other person's actually Allie here. Um, if you know her, she works so hard to help those in need. Um, I've seen her at Sanctuary Youth Center, and, and it's unbelievable how she just embodies Christ with all the kids. They just love her, and it's amazing to see how natural and easy, easy it is for her. So special shout-out to you, too. Um, and, uh, yeah, also one of my favorite preachers, uh, his name's Winky Prattney. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He's kind of like the Australian Bob Brasse. Really cool guy. So is Bob. Uh, but he has this great line. He said, God is looking for willing hearts. God has no favorites. You do not have to be special, but you have to be available. And that's, that's so true. It's, you know, if we continue to use Christ as our pioneer, uh, viewing life through a lens of love the way Jesus did, um, and then just being available, that's really all evangelism is, right? Just being out there for everybody. So that's kind of all I had. I'm not special. I'm just available today. So, thank you. Thank you. It is a privilege to be here. My name is Laura Reyes, aka known as Mauricio's wife. <laughs> um, today, I'm going to speak something about joy. He was talking about love, so this is another fruit of the spirit that is joy. So I don't know if you can see here is joy when life presses in what comes out of you. So many times we don't know what is inside of us until we we encounter pressure or until we get squeezed. My, my son was laughing about that word, but I say like, sometimes we are squeezed in this situation that we think, oh, what is coming out of me? Is it something sweet or is it something sour? So um, I want you to read uh, Philippians 1, 1 to 11. I don't know if you can put it there. Um, this letter is from Paul. So I'm going to read it here. Okay. To all the saints in Christ Jesus and Philippi, together with overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel for the first day until now, being confident of this that who began the, begin the good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ, 
the Christ Jesus. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> um, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. When whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with affection in, in Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth in, of sight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless with, until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So before uh, I continue, I want to give you a little bit of context. Who wrote this, this um, book? It was Paul, also known, previously known as Saul. And if you know this, Saul used to persecute Christians, and he used to kill them. So sometimes we think like, a, I don't deserve God's grace. I'm very far from, from, from him. I have sinned so much. Um, but today is a good news. If God used Paul, a Christian killer, he can use you and me. So, and, and if you don't know, he was the author of most of the New Testament. So he was, like, God uses him so much. So when he, um, the, that, this passage, the joy that Paul is talking is different than happiness. I don't know, sometimes it's, it's very good sell, like, a, oh, the pursuit of happiness, right? But happiness sometimes is based on happenings. And if it doesn't happen, I don't get to be happy. But joy is a decision. So today is your decision. You cannot give it to, to, the, to the, the devil. It's your decision to give it to the devil. Right? Sometimes we are in this pressure that we say, like, God, I cannot find joy. I cannot find joy. Um, so there is one more slide um, that I like. Uh, is, okay, yeah. So Paul is talking about, in this passage, I, 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 I love this because this is like an acronym. And J is for Jesus. O is for others, and Y is for you. Can we say it again? J is for Jesus, O is for others, and Y is for you. So when we find the perfect um, perspective in what is Jesus, and how can we find joy? Is be, First of all, we need to be thankful and joyful for our salvation. Jesus Christ in the cross, what he did for us. And then think about others. He was telling in this letter, like, I'm thinking about you. Like, he really loved the church of Philippa, right? Philippi. Sorry, Philippi. So he really loved the church of Philippi. And he was in this place that nobody wants to be there. He wrote it in a jail, dingy jail. I'm from a third world country. We used to go preach at the jails every month when I was a little girl, and for me it was very impactful because it's a horrible place to be. Horrible. It stinks. It's scary. It's, it, is, it is not a happy place. It's not a joyful place. But he decided to pray with joy, right? That's the other thing I want to say. Like, uh, how can we find joy? Pray with joy. <laughs> we need to pray with joy. Start praying with joy like, like Paul did. Even if we are not in the best situation, if, it's you, if you are not in the right place right now, you start praying with joy and you'll see what God is going to do, right? So I'm going to give you three points. Um, number one is remember what God did. Paul, in this, in this passage, he was talking about, um, I remember of you. But in my heart, I say, like, why is he, is he remember of me? He doesn't even know Laura. But I'm pretty sure he was remi remi remembering this lady that was delivered from the, e the evil spirits. He, he was uh, in remembrance of Lydia, that she was giving her life to Jesus, like, because she could be killed. She could be persecuted because she was opening her home. So he was remembering 
about others and what God did into others, right? And number two, uh, be confident. I like this because it says like, uh, God is not, not done yet with you and he has a purpose. Even if you don't see it, be confident that God is going to do it. Be confident. And number three is love what God is doing. Love it. Probably I don't have the job that I, I deserve or I think I deserve or, or I'm seeking, but be joyful about it. Yeah. So when you start being joyful, I can see like a, sorry, there is a, one thing that I love, like when I, I, I start thinking about what God did in my life, and I look back, I start like praising God, and I, I start being like a thankful. And when I start being thankful, I get like a, how faithful he has been, I get joyful. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So I find the joy with him. So what, love what God is doing for me is like a, even if I don't see the miracle right now, but I see somebody's getting the miracle that I, I wanted, and I've been praying for it, I'm going to rejoice with you. Even if I don't get pregnant or I don't get this job, I don't get this house, but somebody did, I'm going to rejoice with you. And I'm going to pray with joy. So that's, that's, that's pretty much what I had in my heart. And I hope this is a blessing. So today I want you to choose joy and start praying with joy. Hi guys. Um, okay, little like disclaimer. I'm getting over a cold, so if my voice sounds a little funky today, we'll just we'll just go with it. Um, but today, what I wanted to talk about, um, I titled my little message as "God's Call Often Leads Us Beyond Our Comfort Zones." Um, this is a lesson that I've learned repeatedly over the last couple of years, um, and so yeah, I th I think that the importance of surrendering. Um, and our security in God is just holding fast to his promises. And so I wanted to tell you a little story, a very, very brief one. Um, but about three years ago, I was in YWAM, actually, um, and I prayed and I surrendered that dream to God. And I was like, God, I want to go wherever in the world that you want me, um, so send me. And I thought that was France. And then, as we all know, the pandemic hit. <laughs> and this plan that I had given to God that I thought was so God-centered turned out to shift in a different direction. So I ended up, again, going to God and being like, God, what do I do? Um, and so God called me to go to school. And so now I'm halfway through my social work degree. And it's not a direction that I thought two years ago that my life would go. But I'm so grateful for it, the work that I get to do. I'm so passionate about it. And like I'm so excited for where God's leading me. But then very recently, this year has been another, another transition season where I said, OK, God, I'm ready for the next two years in Victoria. I'm happy. I'm excited here. I'm settled. I have an amazing church community. And I want to be here. And God, very kindly, very <laughs> slowly, shut the door <laughs> um, and said, no, I want you in Vancouver. And I said, wait, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, that's, that's not the plan. I surrendered my plan. I said, God, send me wherever you want me to go, but I don't want to go to Vancouver. Like, send me here now. I'm comfortable. I'm secure. And so... I was at a conference a couple months ago wrestling with this, being like, God, like, can I say no? And I think that's a separate message. You can talk to Jesus. I think there's some times when you can say no. But, but the message very specifically when I was praying that evening, and I have never in my life asked so clearly for God, I need confirmation today. Um, and so the message that I heard um, was about how God often call, 
God's call often leads us out, outside of our comfort zones because then we're forced to be reliant on God and not on ourselves. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> and in the, as I left that night, God so clearly spoke to me that I left and I sent a text message to a friend and I was like, I think I'm moving to Vancouver. <laughs> and so I, th- I titled my next little section... Um, the hard and the awkward stuff. Because I think in this season of trusting God, there's like an awkward period. A period of not knowing what you're doing, which I am moving in about a month, and I still don't have a house, um, and I don't quite know how I'm going to make it all work. But the thing is that I trust in God, and I want to be vulnerable in front of all of you today, because I think that's what we need to be as Christians, and, and show our uncertainties and our seasons of struggle and of questioning. It's okay to question. Um, but what God has spoken to me is that he has good plans. I have seen it. I have seen it when I left France and I didn't know what my life would look like next. I have seen it before that, and I have seen it since in the lives of my family, in the lives of friends, in my own. And so I trust that as I sit here telling you this could be really embarrassing. I could be sitting here in September and it would be like I failed. I had that thought. I had that thought when I thought about sharing this message (laughs) and thought, well, maybe this isn't the message for today. Maybe I should just wait until I have it all sorted out. But I think that that's the beautiful thing. And so now we get to the good stuff, and that is part one, (laughs) is that we can trust in God. And so there's purpose in God's guidance. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. And he's a good father. How many of us know that, right? (laughs) He's been faithful. He's sovereign. These are things that I can tell from my life, but I can also tell from the Bible, right? There are so many testimonies. So number two (laughs) is reminding ourselves of God's promises. In the moments of this season where I have wanted to back out and go with a safer, more comfortable path, I remind myself of the promise that he has given me this year. And you can do that too. (laughs) <laughs> and so God has a plan. We see that in Jeremiah 29, 11, which I'm sure most of you know by heart, and that Philippians 4, 19, he promises that he will supply for our needs. And so number three is now this next step for myself and wherever you guys are in your journeys is to move forward and leave the outcome in God's hand. We have to put it to work. And so Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 says, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought of the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the left or the right. Keep your foot from evil. So we have responsibility. We have a responsibility to God to move forward despite that fear and to make wise choices that align with his ways. And so whatever the outcome, whether it's what I expected or what I didn't, God will work in it, and he will work through it. And that's Romans 8, 28. We, and we know that for those who love God, in all, all things work together for good, and for those who are called according to his purpose. So, yeah, guys, I think I leave this with such good news, guys. We have so many exciting things, and we can trust him with our plans, even if it's not what we expect. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So my name is Lisa, for those of you who don't know. And I've been going to Connection for almost three years and almost avoided not doing five and five until just now. So (laughs) I'm just going to jump right in. I'm going to kind of intro a little bit of my testimony. So I actually grew up in a Christian family, so I was very aware of church and God and faith. And that kind of just leads me into kind of my faith now, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that 
the depth of how my faith has been shaped. I feel like growing up around God, that was great, and that was a good foundation, but it still wasn't really enough for me to make it personal and for me to really learn from who God was and what he was teaching me in that. So I find that lately, over time of my faith growing, I've kind of been struggling with doubt and questioning the strength of God and God's voice. So we're just going to jump into James chapter one. We're going to kind of stay here. And James just settled in my heart for this five and five. And so I hope you guys take this away as well. We're going to start in verse five. Um, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with not doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And this part just stuck out to me. He will not apprehend us when we ask him. He knows that it's natural for us to doubt, and he's actually asking us to ask him in 100% faith, knowing that he will follow through and knowing that his promise is there, even if we're kind of insecure in the moment. And it goes on to say in verse 7, for that person must not suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so you just take unstable in that and go back to a, a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. They kind of have the same meaning there. Um, And I feel like during the time of my faith developing, I've always kind of had a little insecurity of hearing God's voice and realizing that I'm the unstable man in that. And that's something we don't love to hear. The word unstable just seems very harsh. Like I'm this unstable person. I'm like the sea just up and down. You can't rely on it. But that's literally the definition of unstable. It's defined as likely to give way to change and also some uh, definitions say to fail because you're thinking two different things. You're not steady. Um, it's confusing, actually. And in Romans ten seventeen, it says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And did we not just hear all of that before in James here? Or in the Gospels in Matthew and Mark, it says it in a different way, just Faith the size of a mustard seed, so you can barely see it, can move a whole mountain. And God promises us that. And I think in me journeying with my insecurities and that, I forget that the word is alive. It is living and active. It's like a double-edged sword, like in Hebrews 4.12. And it's real. It's, It's changing you every single day. And I just forget that. And it shatters doubt right away in the Bible. And so... We'll go back up to verse 2, and a lot of you may know this. It's counted all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And then I found it interesting looking up the definition of steadfast. It means unwavering, fixed in a direction, steady, firm in purpose. And I found it a little ironic, the definition of doubt and steadfast, they are opposites, but they kind of had the same wording, just with different emphasis. Obviously, they're very different meanings. Um, Steadfast is just confident. It does not move. It's disciplined, and it takes time. And I wish we could go through all of James. It's such a powerful little book, but I encourage you to just open it up this week and read what it has. But I think I'm settling on just finding the patience in hearing God's voice. And I love Greek words because I was looking up the Greek definition. The word is actually hypomone, and they're just, the Greek language is so straightforward. They just split up all the words, and it has the meaning right there. And hypo means under, meno means stay, abide, remain, similar the word steadfast, and the root of it is under. So patience isn't just passive waiting. It's not like you're in line at a grocery store just monotonously looking at your watch, waiting for the time to pass, but you're actually actively enduring something. And so a commentary I was reading mentioned it's like you have a heavy load, 
and instead of you searching for a way out with the load, you're actually just staying there holding it until it's time. So you're working hard, but you're not really doing anything, but you're still working hard in that. And that is just such a wonderful reminder. Um, lately, in the season of life that we're in, it's been quite a difficult season, and I found myself asking God kind of the classic why questions that people ask. Um, why this? Why that? Why me? You're kind of victimizing yourself a little bit. You're kind of pointing at God in frustration. And Paul Ebanks actually, a couple weeks ago, preached a sermon called Let's Do It. And at the end, he presented us with four why questions. And I just sat there and I was like, I've been asking God why and Paul is presenting us a different way to ask why. So it may be the same words, like in the definitions of steadfast and doubt, but it's a differing emphasis. It's completely different than the perspective um, that you had before. And I was just like, wow, God is just showing me that I'm asking why, but he's giving me the why, but just in a different way. And I was praying out loud in my room the other day, and I find that sometimes it's weird, but you find that you notice the things that you're feeling a little bit more when you pray out loud. And I was asking God, give me strength in this particular thing. And I was like, wait a second. I don't want strength, actually. No, I'm actually going to stop and not say that. <laughs> because I know you promise that you will be strong for me. I want to cling to you so desperately that I don't need you to give me strength, actually. I want to just cling to your promises. And so that's my prayer for you guys, is don't pray for strength this week. Ask God what he will be giving to you when you get to just draw close to him and rely solely on him, because he is perfect. We don't have to be. We might feel, man, I'm imperfect, I'm not strong enough, but it's true. And don't pray for strength. Like, he's, he's got it. And dwelling in that is the best place you can be. Yeah. Hola a todos. That was powerful. Oh, that's, that's next week. Sorry. Okay. Awesome. Wow, good to kind of see you. I mean, the lights are really bright. I see what Pepe's talking about now. Um, well, today uh, I also have some slides, and I'm going to be using those to like help me keep track of myself. Um, so today I wanted to talk about King David. The writing there is really small, but it's called Finding God in Solitude. So I got to this point because uh, in my own quiet times, I was thinking like, God, I kind of just want to experience you more right now, you know? I want to be just refilled with your passion. And maybe you've prayed that prayer before, too. You just want to be pumped up again. And I think, I was thinking, you know, King David was so passionate. And I was like, what a better example could I look at than King David? So that's how I got there. And I got to the solitude part because I recognized that David was doing something really powerful in his alone times. And that's what I want to get at. So I'll just go to the next slide here, whenever it comes up. Uh, the next slide says, before David was king, he was a shepherd. So being a shepherd was not a very noble profession. Like we think of King David as this great king, super powerful. He defeated Goliath. But even before that, he was just a shepherd. You know, He was just a guy out in the fields. And this was a pretty lowly profession. And it was a pretty lonely profession, too, uh, because he would be out there by himself just day and night, just him and the sheep. Um, but he wouldn't waste that time. He would spend that time praying to God and meeting with God. And I think that's just such a powerful thing, because we can go about our days and not even think about God the whole day, which is crazy. But God, but David would just take that alone time and just be like, hey, God, I praise you, and I worship you, and I know you are good. And he spent all this time just building relationship with God. And I think that's what the next slide says. So David was in his alone time in the fields, just doing his normal thing. But he would meet with God out there in the fields, watching the sheep. So David built his relationship with God. And God prepared him to face his challenges to come. So he didn't even know it at the moment. But every time 
he was out there protecting those, those sheep. He had his sling. He was throwing those rocks at those lions. The whole time, God was training him for the giants to come. And that's where uh, our next slide comes in as well. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel 17, yeah, 1 Samuel uh, 17, 37. So to preface this, uh, Goliath had just shown up in front of the Israelite army, and he's just this giant guy. He's super scary. Everybody in Israel is scared of him, and he's just shouting defiances against Israel and against God. But David is there, and David is the one guy who's not scared of Goliath. And this is what he says. He says this to King Saul as uh, everyone else is shaking in their boots. David says, the Lord, will, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And then Saul said, all right, go ahead and may the Lord be with you. So David was the one guy who was willing to stand up to Goliath. And the reason he was able to do that is because he had spent all that alone time learning about God and learning how powerful God was. He was out there in the fields being trained by God with his sling to fend off the bears and the lions. He had, all, he had beaten all these little challenges, all these little animals that would attack his sheep. He'd beaten them all with the power of God. God who protected him from the bear and the lion, he knew that God would do it again against Goliath. So as David stood up against Goliath, he had his sling. He knew so well how to use it because God was training him the whole time. He hucked that rock, and God led that rock right into the head of Goliath. And that giant was defeated. We've probably all heard that story, or most of us have. But Goliath was only able to know that God would protect him as he stood up against the giant because he'd spent that time with God learning about him beforehand. All right, so that's the first part I wanted to talk about, David's alone time with God. But there's another time that David was alone, and we can look at... Perfect. Okay, this slide, yes. Psalm 63. So to preface this slide, this is a little bit later. David's already king. He's not a shepherd anymore. But he was being chased into the wilderness by his own son, Absalom. Now, his son hated him due to the effects of uh, David's sinful past. When he made some mistakes. And now his son wants to kill him. So David is out there in the wilderness. He's alone again. He's, he could be freaking out. You know, his son has an army. His own son wants to kill him. But David, what does David do in Psalm 63.1? I think I'm just going to read it, my version, right here. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. So Psalm 63. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. So imagine this. David is alone again. He's being chased by an army. He's out in the desert, middle of nowhere. He's a little bit lost. But the first thing he does is he said, God, I seek you first. I don't even need water right now. I'm in a desert. I need you more. Right? And then he says, and this is kind of where I... Just want to end with here. And verse 2 says, I have seen you in the sanctuary, beheld your power and your glory. So I think my last slide is about that. But David was, could meet God in the sanctuary. And you might be thinking, like, where is this sanctuary? Like, do I need a map to find it? Well, the sanctuary is right here, wherever you are. Just like Pepe said before, like half an hour ago, he said, Jesus Jesus uh, gave us that access to God because he died. His blood shed over us, gave us free access to God. And that means that we can turn wherever we are. We can go out in the fields like David was, or we can just be in our room alone, and we can turn to God and be like, God, I need you. I need to experience you, God. And you know what David did? He, I think this is really important. In verse 1, it says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. That's back in Psalm 63 we just read. But he says, Earnestly I seek you. That means he's not half-hearted about it. Earnestly means passionately. He's saying, God, I really, really need you. And that's what we can do too. And when we get to that moment, we will be able to meet God and experience God more in his sanctuary. 
And that's an open gift to all of us. So that's pretty much the word I wanted to share with you. So um, it's been really powerful. Thank you.